What's going on, guys? Sam Donnelly here, resident Haffle Boy from the High AF Lander podcast here on the Outlander Media Network, as well as String Flicker from the band Cambrio, coming at you today with yet another Outlander exclusive interview. I don't know why they keep giving me these, but I don't care. I will talk to all the people, and today's a big one. I, I, I hate to get selfish here, but you guys don't understand, man. I was born in 1985, E.T. came out three years before that, and it didn't come out on video until like two or three years after I was born. Like, imagine that. Imagine seeing a movie in theaters and having to wait five plus years to be able to watch it in your own home. That, the 80s were a tough time, man. That was the best Christmas ever, though, man. I remember my list that I asked Santa for specifically. Like, each item was four things. I wanted E.T. movie. I wanted E.T. Reese's Pieces. I wanted E.T. Pepsi. I guess they had a promotion. I don't know. And I wanted a choo-choo train. And I got all four of those. It was the best Christmas ever. And E.T. just ended up being my favorite movie of all time. I watched it every day and cried like a bitch whenever E.T. left at the end of the movie. Just don't leave, E.T. Why are you leaving me? Like, and I've had I've had abandonment issues ever since. But again, I'm I'm digressing again, guys. I got D Wallace here. I'm gonna just cut to the chase. I got D Wallace here. She was like a second mother to me, man. Like growing up watching that stuff, I didn't even know growing up about all the horror movies. I'd only known her from E. T. But you may you may know her from Cujo. You may know her from The Hills Have Eyes. You may know her from The Stepford Wives. You may know her from The Frighteners. You may know her from pretty much anything Rob Zombie's put out in the past, like, six, seven years. Uh, D. Wallace is everywhere. She's done over 200 movies, guys. Like, that's, that is a, if I wasn't holding a microphone, I would be applauding right now. Um, but this interview is great, guys. It's a, it's, a, it's a short one, but we hit a lot of subjects here. We talk about what it's like to get saucy with Rob Zombie's wife. That's right. If you haven't seen Three from Hell yet, you need to do that. In fact, October 14th, there is a one-night-only comeback for Three from Hell hitting certain theaters. So uh, check your local listings there. We talk about what it's like to work for someone like Rob Zombie and uh, Peter Jackson in comparison with the likes of Steven Spielberg, get really get into the differences of your low budget versus big Hollywood blockbuster filmmaking and what's similar. You, you might be surprised there's a lot of the same. But we get into details in that here. But most importantly, guys, I'm not sure if you guys knew this, but Dee Wallace is also a big advocate of uh, self-help and self-love. And this was something that uh, it, we get kind of personal in the interview because I've been... I've had my own life issues going on, and she, I felt that she really spoke to me when I was researching for the interview. So we really dig deep on that and get down to how important it is to have self-love and to love yourself and how it can even flow through your work on screen as an actress and how it can even help uh, build bonds on the set as well. So this is a great interview, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, but real quick, I just want to shout out again to uh, Otherworldly Coffee. These guys have been keeping me going. If I sound jittery right now, it's because I just had a cup of Firebird. Uh, my coffee cup melted. So uh, you definitely want to get some of that stuff. Uh, otherworldlycoffee.com. Check them out. Uh, they have blends for everything you need, and they're all based off of cool little cryptozoological creatures like Dog Boy, uh, Mothman, and uh, even Bigfoot's on there. So, uh, Get you some coffee over at Otherworldly Coffee. If you put Outlander in the promo box, you will get 20% off. Not 10, not 15, 20! 20% 20 off. Who else is giving you that good of a deal, huh? No one. Outlandermedia.net, guys. So let's get right to it. D. Wallace. What's going on, guys? Sam Donnelly here over from Outlandermedia.net with another Outlander exclusive interview guys if the last one that i did wasn't big enough we're only getting up from here going up you probably know her from the hills have eyes the howling cujo uh, we got three from hell coming out soon but personally i know her as the mother that taught me never to say the phrase penis breath at the dinner table miss <laughs> d wallace oh man i'm excited <laughs> You're funny. Yeah. No swearing at the dinner table. None. None whatsoever. Even when there's an alien lurking about. Exactly. Oh. Especially. 
Well, D, uh, it says here that you were are from Kansas City, grew up in uh, attending the Wyandotte High School, and I have to ask you, because I'm a bit of a foodie, uh, what do you think about Kansas City barbecue? Is it the best, or have you found perhaps maybe another version of that perfect dish elsewhere? No, uh, Kansas City barbecue is the best in the country. What would you say is the and, best restaurant? You know, I've, I travel a lot. I've been a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And Casey barbecue, I don't know. Maybe we put more sugar in it. I don't know, but it's the best. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had it, and it, it's definitely up there. Um, what would you say is the best uh, place to go in Kansas City if someone's there to get barbecue? Well, when I was coming up, it was the Golden Ox. That was the place to go. The Golden Ox. That's where we went for all our proms and all that stuff. But there's a lot of places on the on the Country Cup Plaza now. And there's a lot of dives um, in Kansas City. But, you know, I've been gone for a while, so... Um, I I don't make it when I when I go back. We usually eat at home and and spend time with family, so That's we don't good. go out a whole bunch. Um, but yeah, when we do, we go out for barbecue. Very nice. Or bring it in, or bring it in. Yeah. Right on. I've uh, I've I've had Gates myself. I've always been told that Gates is uh, definitely a good choice place. Gates is excellent. <laughs> it's an Excellent choice. There we go. Gates endorsement by the likes of D. Wallace and Tech Nine. So we've got a we've got a connection there. I dig it. I dig it. Well, um, speaking of all of these uh, movies you've been in, most recently we've got Three from Hell that uh, had a great opening, and it looks like on October fourteenth, one night only, it's coming back to theaters. Um, that's fantastic. I've seen it already. It's I love it. Uh, your role, you disappeared completely into that role. I had to be reminded that that was you when I was watching. Yeah, it. Rob said he actually had a critic call him and go, look, I'm reviewing the film and I love the film, but in my notes it says D. Wallace and I didn't see her in the film. Did you cut her out? <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's one of the best compliments you can give an actor. You oh, know? absolutely. Absolutely. Some of my favorites are the ones that disappear into their roles. Uh, Gary Oldman oh, is, is yeah. one of those. I mean, that's for me, that really rocks my boat to get inside that character and, and disappear, as you say. I was about to ask, what what is it like to kind of, because that character is pretty visceral. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, no spoilers necessarily, but she, uh, she's a bit of a prison guard and a bit of a bitter one at that. And uh, there's some visceral moments between her and uh, Miss Sherry, Sherry Moon. And uh, man, it's tense and the, you can cut it with a, a, a plastic knife. It's just... It's melting, and the, you just you, the two characters lock eyes. I got some intense um, Nurse Ratched from Cuckoo's Nest vibes uh, from that. Uh, where did you find your inspiration for that? Uh, you know where I find my inspiration for every character in me. <laughs> um, uh, there was a, there's also kind of a subliminal lesbian thing. Right. going on there. Right. Um, and she's going to admit it. She's not going to give over to it. Right. But it's, it's, it's that whole cat and mouse game that she plays with Sherry. I had so much fun working <laughs> with Sherry. Isn't she great in this? Oh, she's, she's really, wonderful. really good in this picture. Every person on screen pops out. It, it's, it's visceral. Visceral is the best word I think I can give that movie. Yeah. Yeah, well, Rob, you know, Rob's known for that, first of all, but I, I really think he flipping out did even himself in this. <laughs> um, the, the cinematography is beautiful. The stylization is beautiful. Yes. I, I just think he's a genius. I do. Absolutely. Now, how did you even come up, come about working? Like, you're all over my childhood. I grew up listening to White and Rob Zombie, and I grew up with E.T. literally being my favorite movie, always crying when he left at the very end. Um, 
uh, like you're all over my childhood and, and here you are again like mix mishing and moshing with uh the likes of rob zombie like how did that even come about uh you know rob really god love him loves to work with the older icon mm-hmm. in horror and um when he did halloween uh rob zombie's halloween um he called and wanted me to play Cynthia Strode in it. And um, I went, God, I'd love to work with Rob Zombie. <laughs> and uh, and after I worked with Rob Zombie, I really wanted to work with Rob Zombie more. Um, he just, um, he knows exactly what he wants. He writes it, he does the movie, he directs it. And, um, but he also gives his actors so much freedom to bring in their own ideas mm. and try weird things. I mean, Sherry and I were just all over the the place, all over the map. And um, sometimes, well, almost every night, I would be driving home kind of reliving the day going, oh, my God, I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I... I he he trusts his actors. He has a great vision for us to help us, you know, find whatever it is we want to find. But it's a it's a big um, cooperative effort, I guess, between everybody on the set. And I think that's when you get your best stuff. Yes, absolutely. He seems to cast his movies with with actors and actresses already in mind for literally everybody that's casted, including just the most minor roles. Do you feel that that's true? I do. Um, I know he wrote the part of Sonny for me um, in his, in, in the other film we did together. And, um, you know, I, I think he wanted to give me an opportunity um, not to play the bubbly uh, virginal blonde that I'm often cast right. as or the mother with the big heart. Uh, he wanted to tap into that dark side that as actors, we love to play everything, you know, yes. I do anyway. And so he gave me the opportunity to do that. Uh, really kind of for the first time since I did the frighteners. So, um, yeah, I I had a great time. I mean, the first time I saw it on the big screen, I went, wow, I really can look ugly, can't I? <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. I loved the dynamic, uh, what happened between Sherry and I. Yeah, it, it it's definitely something that sticks out. It's it's one of the, uh, it's it's probably the most poignant part of the first half of the film. It's the thing that sticks out the most. Is just that that well, if you call it a relationship uh, between the two characters. Thank you. And, and I'm so glad that you brought up the Frighteners because you're working with the likes of Wes Craven way back in the day. You're working with the likes of Rob Zombie today. You've worked with the likes of uh, Peter Jackson with the Frighteners. What is all of that like in comparison to working with someone like Steven Spielberg? in pretty much the the top of his game of, of that time like there has to be some drastic differences both in how the performances are directed or suggested and the amount of freedom uh, as you brought up that that a director will give you compared to a very uh expensive and structured uh environment um could you kind of well, give us see, a little bit something on that my my answer to you is the biggest difference is the money Stephen has millions. Rob always does something for under a million. So, but that doesn't affect or dictate their creativity ever in any way. So all the really great directors I've worked for, back to Blake Edwards in 10 and Louis Teague and Joe Dante, they, they all, a good director for me, always knows what they want, uh, creates an environment of trust on the set and allows you, gives you enough direction 
to open up your channel and be able to run with it. And pretty much all directors that I've worked with in my major films do that. When, when I work with some of the smaller directors, um, you know, a lot of times I will go in and help get a project that I believe in. I'll help get it made uh, because I think that people involved have talent and the script is good. Um, but the one thing I find is that they want to micromanage you more. Mm. The big directors know what they want. They go out and get it in the talent, and then uh, they're sure of themselves enough that they can, with strong direction, sit back and let you take it then. Do you find that a less micromanaged environment is an easier one to work in creatively? Oh, God, yes. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> that does kind of sound like I, an easy question, but, it, I mean, it's it's kind of a big thing. Yeah, no, I, I need room because uh, my method, the way I work, is I channel everything. So I don't plan out anything. I, I literally don't know what I'm going to do in the moment until I get in the moment. But... I am the character, and the character, you see, always knows what she's going to do in the moment because right. she's her. So I just go in with an inordinate amount of trust. I mean, it sounds simple. It's really rather a, a complex method to learn. Uh, Charles Conrad was my mentor who changed my life when I learned this technique. Um, but it makes acting so much easier uh, and so much easier to trust yourself uh, because you, you really don't make conscious choices. And when a director says, you know, you know, D, I want her to do this, most of the time the character goes, oh, yeah, that's great, that's great. But uh, sometimes the character goes, no, I can't do that. And then I have to explain to the director why she couldn't do that. Right. And it always makes sense to them. When I explain it, it always makes sense. It's weird. Um, but yeah, I yeah, I, I don't want to do films where I don't have any freedom to create. Amen. Now, speaking of open and trust on the set, again, comparing the bigger budget to the lower budget, especially when you're working on films like Three from Hell, where you're working with a lot of your friends from uh, the you know the heyday of the horror genre, and uh, movies like Death House, where it's a literal, just purpose purposeful ensemble cast. Um, I, I would imagine that building trust on a set where you're working with all of your friends pretty much just makes the whole thing almost like a party at that point. Well, yeah. And you know, we all know that the other person knows. So you're walking on to the set with, with trust already in place. You know, when you, when you're a guest star on a TV show, for example, mm -hmm. um, don't know any of the characters in regards to you working with them. You know them from watching them, right? but you don't know how they're going to be um, in the work environment, right. which can make a huge difference, of course. So how do you, how do you find uh, you that know, trust? It's, it's easier to work with a giving actor than it is an asshole. <laughs> right. <laughs> quote, of the, quote of the interview so far. <laughs> Um, how 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 would you find go about building that trust on a set where you're not as familiar with everybody? Like, say, on the set of ET, where where you have some uh, newer talent and some talent that you just have never worked with in comparison to something like Death House. Um, how do you go about building uh, that kind of that level of trust with essentially strangers? Well, we had a, you know, especially because most of them were kids on ET. Um, Stephen was very smart. He got us together um, so that we could get to know each other, so I could create a bond with the kids, which is very important mm. um, when you're working with any kind of of 
well, any actor, but especially a child. And so um, I took a lot of time to create um, a relationship with the kids. Usually you go in and I think the, the biggest, the shortest answer I can give you is to always respect the other actor that you're working with. Mm. Because if, um, if you respect them, then they feel trust for you and vice versa. Right. It's reciprocal. Right. And you don't ever try to direct another actor. A lot of times I'll have an idea and I'll turn to my other actor and go, does this feel right for you uh, in the scene? Is this, is this going to fly for you? Do you have any other ideas? You know, because the word, to walk in and look like you're taking over everything, which says to them, I don't have the input that I need to create what I need. And then you, you're you kind of at an impasse. Right. It seems like a very almost empathetic process. Absolutely. Very nice. Absolutely. It's, you know, again, when everybody works together to their highest ability that's when you get the good stuff <laughs> beautiful beautiful well real quick i want to segue into something but uh it's a weird segue from horror into something like uh self-help and self-love but i find it fascinating because being a fan of the horror genre and having a bit of a troubled childhood myself a lot of fans of horror kind of have a bit of that broken upbringing and um a lot of people may not know this but on top of just rocking over 200 movies and over 400 commercials uh you just recently did your first ted talk uh on the common ground of self where you go into uh your own past and your own upbringing and the struggles that you had to go through and I personally, uh, if I may insert myself into the interview here, I personally got a lot from that because I can kind of relate in a lot of ways. And uh, hearing you talk about what it's like to kind of reparent yourself, do you think that uh, having this this uh, this career of uh, reaching out to others and helping them learn how to love themselves again and, and love their inner child again. Um, do you feel that your connection with the horror genre, which is so strong already, do you think that you can use that to take that message to them? Well, I think I use all of me and everything that I've experienced to take my message to them because you know, in the end, we're all one energy. I'm you, you're me, uh, and everybody, everybody has gone through grief, some kind of abandonment, some kind of disappointment in their lives. The, you're, we're, we're living on a physical plane, and that's a given. Um, but I, I laughingly say, you know, I spend half of my life um, portraying people in fear, and the other half of my life showing people how they can heal from fear. So the two worlds actually coincide in a rather interesting way. I love that dichotomy. Uh, for me. Yeah, because, you know, in the, in the parts I play and in the, a lot of the movies I do, um, we, we go to the theaters to experience fear in a safe place so that we can practice how to handle it. Just like a little kid watches all the Disney movies and they've done all these studies where they always want to go back and, and watch the scary parts <laughs> because they're practicing learning how to handle their fear. Um, the, the biggest fear that we're running away from in our own lives is the illusion of fear is literally the fear of the fear, if you will, because most of the things we're afraid of never happen. Oh, I'm going to run out of money. Oh, I'm going to be sick when I'm older. Oh, he's going to leave me someday. You know? Uh, so 
we, our, our fear comes from not living in the moment and knowing that we are absolutely the only ones in control of how we handle that moment. We are the God of us on this plane. Nobody can think thoughts for us, hold perceptions for us, feel feelings that we, you know, don't want to feel, uh, take actions unless we decide we want to take them. So we're the creators of us. And the more you find out your belief systems where you're hitting the wall and keeping yourself in fear, the freer you get. That's beautiful. That is amazing. I love that so much. Well, and it's true. It's It'll be your freedom, guys. I guarantee it. It will be your freedom. You and me have both seemingly been listening to the new Tool album, and I like that. Um, just a little joke. But, uh, no, I, I love that. I, <laughs> I got it. I, I, I That is definitely uh, hitting on a lot of the same chords, that uh, a lot of the same struggles that I personally have been going through lately when it comes to dealing with my upbringing and uh, trying to kind of reconnect and reparent, as you said, and really learn how to live in that moment, which seems to be the entire theme of this interview is is, is very living in the moment, even when you're acting, uh, yep. being that character as it is there then. Absolutely. Because uh, if you're in this moment now, you're in the f full experience of your expression in the moment. And... That doesn't allow fear. That's that beautiful. only allows action and decision and choice and commitment. And once you make a choice and commit to it, the fear goes away because literally you're saying, I'm going to do this no matter what. And I'm taking my first step of action out into the world to do it. And, you know, I think Nike really didn't realize the power of that slogan when they came out with it, if they even do today, just do it. Right. Because if you just do it, you can't sit and stew in the fear and the lack of choice and commitment, which keeps you, by the way, in your fear. So it's a, it's a vicious circle that ultimately implodes upon itself. Absolutely. I think that's a message that really needs to be put out there way more often than it is. Well, I, people don't understand that a, your brain around how you see yourself and how you see yourself in the world and how you, you see the world seeing you, it's all in place by seven years old. So if you want to really see the walls that you're hitting, go back and around any subject and really pull up what you were verbally told, like about money, about relationships, about being uh, able to heal your body, and, or what you were modeled, because we learned a lot by watching what was modeled for us, mm -hmm. even though if it, it wasn't said. And uh, you will see why you keep hitting the same blocks because your little child is so fearful of you breaking out of those wrong, false, limiting belief systems because they think they're going to die if they do. That's what they were taught when they were little. Right. So you've really got to reparent yourself to go, well, I ain't going to buy into that BS anymore. <laughs> that's, that's great. I think, I think that's a, a for for especially fans of horrors and fans of movies, uh, movies are a form of escapism. You know, that's how we, we get away from the grind. And, you know, that is your grind. And that going on that grind for you, from what I've gathered, has, has kind of been your escapism as well, trying to find out with between uh, that seven-year-old point to the now point, trying to find that self-love, trying to actually... Uh, get it from outside sources instead of trying to find it from within. Well, yeah. And, you know, that's that's the problem with most relationships is we're waiting for somebody to complete us 
instead of getting to work completing ourselves. Right. And then attracting someone to have relationships with that are also complete. Right? Right. And so when two complete people who are working on themselves and um, peaceful and happy and loving themselves... Uh, when those two people come together, then you've got a really strong bond there that you can create just about anything with. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And speaking as a fan of movies, horror films uh, especially, uh, I will speak on behalf of us all and say that you are doing the Lord's work when it comes to both helping us get that catharsis that we need and delivering such a, a, a highly needed message uh, for us anxious, uh, anxiety ridden and depression ridden, uh, millennials <laughs> that grew up in the eighties and nineties. So, uh, if you, if you had one more super important parting message to fans of yours that have, uh, looked to your work for a way to escape their own struggles, what would it be? Take responsibility for yourself mm. and love yourself first Love yourself first. Love yourself so much that you literally, every decision you make comes from, does this serve the love I have for me? Every decision, down to the, down to the, each calorie that you eat. Well, sure. I mean, how many people keep saying, I can't lose weight, I can't lose weight, I can't lose weight. And then they turn around and they eat crap. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, that that does not that that's not in harmony with loving yourself. If you love yourself, you're going to take care of your body. You know, if I, you love yourself, you're not going to be in relationships that abuse you, right? And use you, right? And ultimately, when you truly love yourself in every way, you serve everybody else in the highest way, also. It's it's a candle that that can light other candles. You bet. Perfectly said. That's amazing. Well, guys, I I am elated right now. I think this has been an amazing time spent with you. Thank you so much. You heard her. Love yourself, everybody. And here's a great way to love yourself. Next Monday, October 14th, one night only. Three from Hell's coming back to theaters. Go see D. She's great. Her and Sherry Moon have a lot of sexual tension. It's great. It's awesome. Uh, Dee, thank you so, so much for joining us here today. It has been my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, I had a blast. Hopefully we can do it again. Okay, baby. You let me know. Oh, I will. I will indeed. Okay.